everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to a new season of Arts in the City. First up today, Lower Manhattan has a beautiful new performing arts center located at the World Trade Center site. The impressive building has something for every art lover. Donna Hanover takes us on a tour. The spectacular Perlman Performing Arts Center has opened at New York's World Trade Center next to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. The building is a cube sheathed in marble panels that are perfectly matched. They turn from an elegant cream color in the daytime to gold at night. It also looks exquisite on the inside and the architect Joshua Ramos explains why. It's a thin piece of marble, half inch thick, that's been laminated between two pieces of glass. And then that's put into what we call a, an insulated glass unit. So it's a, from an energy standpoint, it's a high performance facade system. And the marble has a little bit of ferric oxide in it. And that's what gives the marble from the outside during the day, makes it look cream colored as opposed to white. But that iron is what, when the light comes through, it gives it the amber tint. And then that process flips at night, right? When you have the lights on the inside go through the glass and it appears amber on the outside. The building is especially important to Joshua since he was here in his apartment three blocks away during the 9-11 attacks. You remember a lot about those days? Um, I remember too much about those days. Working on a performing arts center as part of the World Trade Center site in itself is just an extraordinary commission, an extraordinary honor. Artistic director Bill Rausch says the performances will include dance, music, theater, opera, speakers, and film. What does it mean to affirm life and to bring people together at this location? There were 93 countries represented in the people who lost their lives in 9-11, and so we take that responsibility of being a truly international and truly citywide organization very seriously. One astounding aspect is that the three theaters inside have movable floors, walls, and seating so they can be reconfigured to change shape and size. We have up to 62 different audience configurations, different ways that audience can be in relationship to the actors. The floor can go up, the seats can the fly up. The walls go up and down at the push of a button. It's, it's extraordinary. Chair of the board, former Mayor Michael Bloomberg, has put great effort into the center. He, Ronald Perlman, government groups, and many others gave funding. The construction took several years and brought big challenges. Joshua and colleagues at the architecture firm he founded, Rex, knew the physical design of the building would be hard because there are 13 subways and trains below it. We had to reverse engineer the building. We had to find the places within all that existing infrastructure that we could bear the building off of and move up. And acoustically, the thing you're concerned about is called low frequency. So that rumbling of the train goes up the structure, and if the auditoria are affixed to the primary structure, it just translates right into the space. We had to make the performance spaces we call a box-in-a-box -box construction. So there's basically independent structures floating within the larger building. This is the grand staircase most visitors will use to enter the Performing Arts Center. The beautiful lobby upstairs will be open to everyone, and there will be free concerts there for people, including families, to enjoy. The lobby interiors and restaurant were designed by David Rockwell, and the restaurant is headed up by acclaimed chef Marcus Samuelson. The Performing Arts Center is called PAC NYC for short, and individuals and companies will even be able to rent some of the spaces for their own events. The years of commitment by Joshua and many others show. As a subtle touch, the shape of the building even echoes the shape of the 9-11 Memorial. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. Commuting with culture. Our next stop is Grand Central Madison, the MTA's new terminal connecting Long Island to the east side of Manhattan. The station is a hub for travel and public art viewing with a permanent collection that rivals a museum trip. Amid the bustle of travel, an oasis of creativity and calm, the newly opened Grand Central Madison, which brings riders from Long Island directly into Midtown's east side, is home to a collection of permanent mosaic artwork, work that feels both delicate in its beauty and yet deeply enduring. All of the art that we commission, certainly here at Grand Central Madison, the artists have one criteria, and that is to create work that speaks to the place, 
speaks to the people who are going to use that place so that when they come through, they know this was created with them in mind. Sandra Bloodworth, head of the MTA's Arts and Design program, gave us a one-on-one -on -one tour of the space. She explains the work of renowned artists Kiki Smith and Yayoi Kusama were painstakingly recreated underground with professional mosaicists. When you're creating artwork in the transportation environment, it must be durable and it must last forever. The interpretation of the, of the artwork, the original artwork, through the eyes of the mosaicist, the fabricator, brings the work to life where, it, where you see the original work, but actually transformed. We spoke with artist Kiki Smith from her studio. She explained what that process was like for her. They cut and chose every piece of glass and interpreted my drawing. And so for me, the richest part of it is that I got to see they made decisions that weren't that that brought the mosaic to its realization, but I couldn't have done on my own. And right. that was very, you know, incredibly exciting for me as an artist. As impressive as Grand Central Madison is, it's only one stop in our city's vast transportation museum. The arts and design program was created in the 1980s. Now there are nearly 400 works of art in the subway and rail system from world famous to emerging artists, from mosaics and sculpture to poetry. And while art can't solve every problem underground, Sandra believes it makes a difference. It's the People's Museum. And works that you might see in the Med or at MoMA, you can now see here in the New York subway and rail stations. The message is now clearly that someone cares about this place, and that's what the art has done. Sesame Street has always lived in the hearts of both children and adults, and now you can find it in the theater district, too. Sesame Street the Musical returns to Off-Broadway with all the beloved Muppets on stage. Andrew Falzone got a first look at our favorite fuzzy playmates. They've delighted children for generations. And now the Muppets, who usually call Sesame Street home, have set up shop Off-Broadway for a second consecutive year. This time for a run at Theater 555 that brings so many of our favorite Sesame Street characters to the stage, Jonathan Rockefeller is putting it all together. It's really fun to bring this show back to New York City. Uh, last time it pretty much sold out. We have uh, 30 different characters throughout the show, um, which includes honkers and uh, singing shoes and all kinds of fun, silly things, as well as everybody else you know and love, the like Ernie, Bert, uh, Rosita, Elmo, of course, Grover, Cookie Monster, and so on and so on. The storyline follows the Muppets as they learn what it takes to put on a musical of their own. In need of a star, the show's only human co-star, portrayed by Genevieve Jors, is roped into learning what it takes to be a Broadway triple threat from industry legends like Rosita. It's uh, a lot of inspired, silly, wonderful fun. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big responsibility when you're given a property like Sesame Street to work with uh, the Sesame Street team to make sure that we're, we're constructing the right show for the right demographic, for the right audience. And for those who are sensitive to sight and sound, Sesame Street the Musical will offer sensory-friendly performances. So the honkers are here to help me at a regular performance. A regular performance would sound like this. 
and a sensory friendly performance would sound like this. So this show is actually built from the ground up with sensories in mind. Uh, what we do in those particular performances is we adjust the sound levels and the light levels and make sure that some of the louder sound cues aren't being played and provide a really nice space for people to come in and feel comfortable. Audiences will also take comfort in seeing Sesame Street classics performed live, like the iconic C is for Cookie, performed by Cookie Monster. as well as original songs from Nate Edmondson and accomplished composer Tom Kitt, who's won multiple Tonys, a Grammy, and a Primetime Emmy for his past musical endeavors. Kitt met up with Elmo at Sardi's, where they discussed the finer points of vocal technique for Playbill. And then you want to warm up, you vocalize. Maybe you do something like, la, 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 la. Oh, can I watch Rocket? Yeah. La, 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 la. Also contributing to the musical mix is Helen Park, Grammy nominated for her work on K-pop. When I first came to America, it was in 1994. Um, I was in second grade and I had no knowledge of English language whatsoever. The only thing I could say was, you know, hello and thank you. And so I remember learning English through watching Sesame Street at home. And Park says Sesame Street helped her connect to America and hopes her song, You Can Be a Star, will help kids connect to their confidence. As a person that's grown up in two different cultures, you know, uh, Korean culture and American culture, I always felt like I'm just not enough. And this song uh, is really telling you, you are enough, believe in yourself. And all of the show's creative contributors hope that the message resonates with its young audience, for whom Sesame Street the musical may well be their first theater experience. The great joy about that is even the audience members sometimes watch each other. If you bring your younger family along, you want to see the joy that they are experiencing in the audience. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. Now to entertainment of another kind. Actor Adam Scott is set to return in season two of Apple TV's hit show, Severance. Neil Rosen sat down with him just before the actors and writers strike. Here's their conversation. Are you ready? Yes. No, babe, are you ready? Are you ready to hear from Adam Scott? Who we know from such comedies as Parks and Rec. I mean, look at what I've accomplished. Scott has also made us laugh hard in the film Step Brothers. And I can sing high. But last year, Adam Scott switched gears, starring in the acclaimed sci-fi dramatic series, Severance. This Twilight Zone-esque thriller revolves around employees whose non-work memories disappear the minute they enter the office. Well, every time you find yourself here, it's because you chose to come back. You're so adept at comedy. I mean, I know you from Step Brothers and Parks and Rec. Is comedy your background? You know, it's weird. It's sort of the opposite. I started out as more of a dramatic actor, always kind of thought I would, I would uh, be more of a dramatic actor, and that was the path I was, I was following. And then, just as a fluke, I got the role in Step Brothers. Um, someone dropped out of that role, and they had to cast it quickly, and I just was in the right place at the right time and got that part, and that sort of changed the direction of my career and I just started doing more okay, comedic so stuff and had a, was having an incredible time uh, doing it and uh, and so once Parks and Rec ended almost 10 years ago now I kind of felt like maybe I would try uh, to find some more stuff that's a little more serious or dramatic or whatever and you know made an effort to do that and auditioned for Big Little Lies and got that role and and, and that sort of led me to, uh, to Severance. Did you go to acting school and study dramatic stuff? Yeah, I did. I, I now wish that I had, you know, gone to and done UCB and all of that because it's, uh, it's so much fun. I kind of learned, uh, you know, comedy uh, sort of on the job, you know. Severance is a really interesting show. It's also a really complex one. How was this originally pitched to you? 
Yeah, Ben Stiller called me, uh, who's the ex executive producer and director of the show. He called me, I remember it was January 2017, uh, and just gave me the quick sort of, you know, three sentence pitch, the premise of the show. And it just sounded so interesting and exciting. Um, and this is before it was like written. He just said, I just want to put this bug in your head about it. And at some point, we're going to try and make this. But I just thought of you and thought maybe you would be interested in this. And, and then it was a couple years later, I actually read a script. What attracted you to do Severance? I like everything about it. I love the, the character, and I love the concept and the idea. I think it's a really brilliant idea that Dan Erickson had, uh, the creator of the show. Genre-wise, it's my favorite. Uh, Twilight Zone is one of my favorite shows, and it has that really fun, twisty uh, sci-fi premise. But the most important thing are the characters, and they really uh, oh, came just, up with some incredible characters that they got that. unbelievable really actors fresh. to play. With Adam Scott, I'm Neil Rosen for Arts in the City. Style, diversity, and culture come together at the Fashion Institute of Technology. A new exhibit at FIT's museum showcases the work of contemporary Latin American and Latinx designers. Susan John takes us inside. Showcasing a wide range of styles, materials, and inspiration, diversity is on display at the Museum of FIT's exhibition, Moda Oi, Latin American and Latinx Fashion Design Today. With designs from almost a dozen Latin American countries, this exhibition is definitely not one size fits all. When we think of Latin American fashion, um, we tend to think of bright colors and ruffles and tropical styles. Um, and one of the aims of this exhibition is to really showcase that Latin American fashion is so much more than that. There's not a single Latin American style. And you have many designers from different uh, backgrounds in all respects, right? Like nation different nationalities, different uh, educational backgrounds, different life experiences. Some of them do evening wear or urban styles. That distinctiveness is evident in these fashions which focus on everything from politics to pop culture. We have themes in the exhibition. We have eight themes total. These themes range from popular culture and indigenous heritage um, to art and gender. We have a section on sustainability, craftsmanship, and also a section that looks at the concept of elegance. There's a primary focus on politics, which makes a prominent appearance in many of the designs. We have um, a sweatshirt by the Mexican-American designer Willy Chavarria that says no human is illegal. Um, and so that was uh, designed in reaction to a lot of the U.S. immigration policies um, that were going on at the time. We have a handbag by the Venezuelan designer Liliana Yepes. Um, this was a special handbag that she created um, in response to some of the student protests that were going on um, in response to the presidential elections. There are also styles that serve as an outlet for designers personally impacted by politics. Maria Cornejo is a designer who came who was a political refugee in London from the Pinochet regime in Chile. And so her family moved there and um, she went to school in the UK and she speaks a lot about how it was really complicated for her to come to a new country, learn a new language, and she found that through art and fashion, she could communicate some of those ideas. And just as politics is a part of the fabric of the Latin American experience, so is indigenous heritage. For many Latin American countries, our indigenous heritage is a part of who we are as, as nations. And so many designers, what they do is they collaborate with artisans or indigenous um, designers or makers to create uh, collaborative um, designs. So for example, we have um, a shirt that was co-designed by a Mexico City designer, Guillermo Vargas, from a brand called One Eighth Takamura. And 
Paula Perez Vasquez from the town of Santa Maria Tlahuitoltepec in Oaxaca, Mexico. It includes embroidery that's, um, that belongs as collective heritage from Santa Maria Tlahuitoltepec. Craftsmanship is another important theme of the exhibition, which showcases skills that are on par with couture creations. And this section highlights things that are handmade. It highlights a certain dignity of the handmade. It highlights a slower way of producing clothes. And this idea that craftsmanship and artisanal work is a really important part of heritage in Latin American culture. Um, and it's skills that are honed and valued. And there's a lot of pride that go into, you know, sort of refining these skills. So it's this, again, this dignity of the handmade that really shines through. Regardless of the design or inspiration, what really shines through is the talent. What we want people to know and to see is that Latin American fashion is a powerhouse, that there really is um, so much talent that has gone unrecognized or overlooked for so long. Um, and so we want to showcase that. For Arts in the City, I'm Susan Jun. It takes big imagination to create New York in miniature, and that's exactly what Brooklyn artist Danny Cortez does. His meticulously crafted mini models of graffiti-infused streets from the 1980s have earned him international acclaim. Our Barry Mitchell paid Danny a little visit. Hey, I saw Danny Cortez the other day. Small world. Kids, please go back to the way that they were before. Without you, I'm hurting more. How do we play the games in a certain yard? The one for me, the one for me. I'm a miniature artist uh, based out of Brooklyn, Bushwick. I just try to document my era, which is the 80s, 90s. I could go f far as back as Mr. Rogers, but I, I knew that I don't come from that world. Okay. I was like more urban, so let me document my my surrounding. This is under. This is an ice box under glass. Why is it under glass? Because this is the first piece I ever did that started this whole obsession of miniatures. It it just you know I didn't know what materials to use. I used some cheap dollar store foam core, uh, some shish kebab skewer sticks there. This Chinese restaurant is yes. an actual place. It's an actual place. And it was bought for quite a lot of money by a famous rapper. Yes. Tell us how much. Okay, come on, uh, come on. $10, 10K, 10K, 10 10K, 10K, 10,000 dollars. And how's this for prestige? Sotheby's auctioned Danny's miniature newsstand as part of its art and influence of hip hop collection. And then there's that second auction of Danny's newest, most ambitious project yet. It's called The Block. This is how New York City looked like when the genre hip hop was born. It tells stories too. Do you see like, they're getting mugged here. <laughs> Uh, you have a little mailbox, it got be, might be a squatter in there, abandoned cars, tons of rubble. Wait, how long did that take? This bad boy took three months yeah. because it has the underground station too. All his life, Danny held a series of unfulfilling jobs. Then the pandemic hit. These miniatures say, they definitely saved my life because I was going through so much at that time. I was, it was very dark D during the pandemic, very dark. So going through a divorce, going through so much at the time, financial situations, and then all of a sudden, I'm, we're in a lockdown now. Having these tools around, I ain't gotta have these tools laying around, and it just sparked this idea, okay, now I can work on, on, on art. Let's, let's try it, this thing that I, I wanted to try. Every time I worked on a piece, I, all, that, all those problems disappeared. For Danny, it's all about nostalgia. So this is a street pole. It represents like a personal piece for, for anyone. Who doesn't want a, a street pole sitting in their living room to represent where they came from? I'm from Brooklyn and I took music lessons on Avenue D. Look at that, you see? So this brought you memories just by looking at it. I did my job. I just find it hysterical that these things that we, do, we pass by on the street mm -hmm. and ignore, you find meaning and purpose I in them. I find it so beautiful. Beautiful? Beautiful. It's an eyesore to many people, but it tells a story from the rust, from the stickers, the graffiti. It's documenting a time of New York City. I see. It's a, it's a, it's a time, a period. It's a time capsule. Right.
So would I be incorrect to say a beat up, rusty, defaced mailbox is your Mona Lisa? Absolutely. You won't be wrong. <laughs> you, hit, you nailed it. You nailed it. That's right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so Danny much. Danny Cortez, thank you. Thank you. And you're watching Arts in the City. Before we go, we'd like to take a moment to say thank you and congratulations to our colleague and very good friend, Barry Mitchell, who is retiring. Barry, we wish you nothing but happiness and lots of laughs in this next chapter. You certainly gave us plenty. Hop along Cassidy Theater every Saturday morning on Kennedy TV. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Hop along Cassidy. Fun to watch and delicious. We're going to talk about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Dredgers. Brooklyn dredgers. We dredge garbage off the Gowanus Canal. You don't have to travel to Venice for vistas that boost your morale. There's romance and sometimes raw sewage on Brooklyn's Gowanus Canal. Have a socially distanced Christmas. Have a drink and let's relax. Uncle Cy is dropping by. He had his booster vax. Well, we spent all the time we can on this. My house is standing, but it's flat. Allie's is standing, and it has some dimension and a smokestack made out of a cheese whiz container. I think you're the winner, Allie. Thank you. Build your own gingerbread house in minutes. Well, we follow the instructions. That was easy, wasn't it? Come on, I'll take you to see Santa. Uh, hi, I'm Barry Mitchell. Carol Ann will be here in a minute. Carol Ann? No! You said you'd do this. <sighs> Fine. That is our show for today. Oh, Thanks no, no, so no, 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 no. As Harpo with the horn. Happy? Very nice. We will miss you, Barry. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Arts in the City.